Okay, yeah, thank you. So yeah, I see uh, a few new faces, uh, Chris and Grace. Oh, wait a minute. It seems that Chris and Grace, are, are you on the... Okay, I see. I'm like, <laughs> I'm having double vision there. Okay, so welcome. Um, we have uh, had many modules now of this Discovering Buddhism and um, I'm trying to foster a kind of family feeling. So in the uh, previous modules, we've always uh, you know, kind of introduced ourselves. So um, I'll introduce myself first to break the ice. My name is Tenzin Namjong. I am here in uh, South India, Sarah J uh, Monastery. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but uh, I'm originally from uh, the US, Hawaii. And uh, now I've been studying here for many years. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm very happy to I have been asked to do this uh, Discovering Buddhism course for uh, a largely, uh, uh, you know, North American based audience. So um, thank you. So yeah, you can introduce yourselves. And I'm especially interested in sort of what level of previous uh, background you've had with meditation and, and Buddhism. Uh, my name's Chris from San Jose, California. Um, I have no background of Buddhism, but I definitely want to gain that and gain my um, my spiritual connection. You know, um, to have a clearer mind and a yeah, just a clearer vision, better outlook on life. So that's what I'm here today for. Great. Hi, I'm Grace. Uh... I'm also from the Bay Area. Um, I have a very uh, limited experience with Buddhism. Um, I've tried meditation or like yoga in the past, but somewhat limited in my experience. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, you've come to the right spot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, although we have been uh, doing, uh, I think, I don't know, maybe eight modules already, then uh, this module itself, um, establishing a daily meditation practice, will uh, kind of be taking all the, the parts that we've been studying in our more philosophical studies and putting it in a quite... Uh, practical how we actually integrate uh, these these teachings uh, into our, our daily lives and um, sort of yeah gain a deeper level of uh, understanding uh, from the teaching beyond just the mere sort of intellectual uh, academic study yeah so um, yeah that said let us just uh, start in the usual way. So uh, what I've been doing every time we've had a, a module uh, begin, uh, there are certain mm, prayers that are said and um, yeah, sort of in keeping with the, the tradition that's been passed down over the, the centuries uh, by the, the previous uh, gurus of the lineage, uh, then I thought to uh, you know, follow that tradition. So let me do a screen share. Okay, the power is back on. So let's see here. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm, I mentioned to Mary Ellen, but I actually have to leave at, um, hmm in about uh, 90 minutes. So usually we have uh, two hours, but um, yeah, today we'll have about a hundred minutes together. So. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do this at the beginning, right? So, um, These are some of the, the 
prayers at the beginning of the teachings. And so, uh, you know, since Buddhism uh, was uh, taught by uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, right, the, the historical Buddha of our time, right, then to uh, sort of um, remember the source of the teaching and um, foster a, a sense of uh, respect and um, uh, kind of make our minds open uh, to receive this uh, wisdom that has been uh, taught by the Buddha, then we remember, uh, recall the, the good qualities of, of the Buddha, and then uh, also the Dharma or his teachings. And then there's also the, uh, the Sangha or the uh, community of a spiritual aspirants. So those are the, the so-called three jewels of refuge, which um, those of you who did the previous module, uh, you know a, a lot about that in, in great detail. But um, uh, yeah, so we can start uh, here. <clears throat> so uh, the guru, teacher, Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, know of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans, to you, Buddha, Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the guru, teacher, Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, know of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans, to you, Buddha, Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Guru, teacher of Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly complete Buddha, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, Sugata, nor of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans, to you, Buddha, Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. When supreme among humans, you were born on this earth, you paced out seven strides, then said, I am supreme in this world to you who are wise then, I prostrate. With pure bodies formed supremely pure, wisdom ocean like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, winner of the best, savior to you I prostrate. With su supreme signs, face like a spotless moon, color like gold to you I prostrate, dust free like you, the three worlds are not, incomparably wise one to you I prostrate. The savior having great compassion, the teacher having all understanding, the field of merit with qualities like a vast ocean, to you, the one gone to thusness, I prostrate. The purity that frees one from attachment, the virtue that frees one from the lower realms, the one path, the sublime, pure reality, to the Dharma that pacifies, I prostrate. Those who are liberated and who also show the path to liberation, the holy field qualified with realizations, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you, the sublime community, intending virtue, I prostrate. Do not commit any unwholesome actions. Engage in perfect wholesome actions. Subdue one's own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a defective view, a better lamp flame, an illusion, a dew drop, a water bubble, a dream, lightning, a cloud. See all causative phenomena like this. By these merits, may transmigratory beings attain the state of all seeing, subdue the enemy of faults, and be freed from the ocean of samsara, disturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, why don't we skip the Heart Sutra this time? And then we can do this, uh, taking refuge in generating bodhicitta, right? So uh, for the sake of the newcomers, right? So, you know, this thought of refuge, <laughs> it's funny. The normal kind of worldly example I give for refuge is that you know, when it starts to rain, we go like under a roof um, for protection because we don't want to get wet. So actually here at the house that uh, Venerable Lexok and I are staying at, we're undergoing uh, roof renovations. <laughs> so they've torn off all of the, the kind of um, old roof and this time in India, it's actually the dry season. But for some reason, there was a, a big downpour yesterday. <laughs> and so now with the, the protection that the old roof gave, and that's now gone, the, all the rooms are leaking. And just to show you. So this room where, where I normally give teachings. Um, I'll show you. 
You see, <laughs> it's, those are the buckets of, of the, the leaky roof, right? So in order to, to take refuge, right, you're seeking protection from, from some, some kind of, you know, suffering or, you know, some undesirable um, uh, kind of experience, right? And then you look for something that's going to give you protection. But um, once you find that thing that gives you protection, you have to, um, you know, not just say, oh, may the roof protect me, but you actually have to, uh, you know, do something. You have to go under the roof, right? And um, uh, so similarly, uh, we mm, want happiness. We don't want to suffer. And all the things that we've been trying uh, in our lives thus far, well, we've had, um, you know, ups and downs, sometimes suffering, sometimes happiness. And, uh, you know, the Buddha mm, wanting us to have a, a lasting uh, peace, well-being, uh, then inquired as to what is, is truly the cause of suffering, what's truly the cause of happiness. And then uh, he discovered that actually the suffering or happiness is all coming from our own mind, which is why in this uh, previous stanza, we saw, right? Oops. Do not commit any unwholesome actions engage in perfect wholesome actions to do one's own mind. This is the teaching of Buddha, right? So why? Why would the Buddha teach this? Uh, well, it's because um, further to the view of karma, then our suffering or happiness is fundamentally rooted in our own actions that we've done in the past. So since our unwholesome actions lead to suffering, then we have to be very uh, diligent and vigilant not to commit any unwholesome actions. And then on the flip side, uh, whatever happiness we receive, uh, whatever happiness we've experienced, uh, that's uh, come as the ripening effect of our wholesome actions, our good deeds. So we must engage in these perfect wholesome actions. And uh, what makes the actions wholesome or unwholesome um, fundamentally is the motivation with which we undertake the action. So those actions done with a, a disturbed mind, a mind of anger, jealousy, pride, right? These disturbing emotions, hmm? then those will impel us to, you know, when we're angry, uh, we might kill or harm others. Uh, then when we feel a mind of love or compassion, we'll engage in activities that will, you know, benefit others. So to subdue these, uh, negative emotions, and to also increase our positive ones, that is the uh, teaching of the Buddha. So uh, the Buddha taught these methods, which are then contained in the Dharma, and then the, the community of spiritual aspirants uh, form the Sangha. So with these three, uh, then we kind of commit ourselves to training in the Dharma, following the example of the other Sangha members who are also training and uh, putting into practice the teaching of the Buddha. So to remind ourselves of that, then we say this uh, taking refuge verse, right? Um, and then uh, what is the motivation, right? To listen to these teachings? Well, yes, we want to have happiness. We don't want to suffer, but actually, all sentient beings, all beings who have a mind like us, they also don't want to suffer. They don't, uh, you know, want to experience these, you know, various pains, mental and physical. They also want happiness. And so, mm, even with this mind wanting others to mm, not suffer, uh, even having a mind saying, "Okay, I'm going to do something about it," we see in our current situation. We have very limited ability to help others, right? We can maybe, um, I don't know, we see a beggar on the street. We can maybe, you know, give them some money, food, clothing, right? But mm, fundamentally, uh, and this we talked about in the other uh, module about samsara, right? Samsara being this uh, situation we find ourselves in 
where you know the mind in the buddhist cosmology is beginningless and we have taken rebirth countless countless times right and these rebirths uh are just sort of thrown we're thrown into our next rebirth by our karma we have very little control over the situation and once we have taken rebirth and have uh, su such a body like this then uh you know this human body what happens we get sick we get hungry right we uh you know get uh too cold you know or too hot depending on the weather conditions and um uh, so having this type of uh, birth this uncontrolled rebirth within uh, samsara is then the uh, sort of uh, makes possible all the other sufferings that we experience so if we want to uh, be free from the suffering we need to be free of all of samsara which means being free from this un uncontrolled cycle of rebirth. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we then need to uh, generate a particular kind of wisdom about the ultimate nature of reality. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was the subject of another module. But anyway, not so much time to get into all that now. But uh, in brief, the source of all of our suffering is also in our minds. It's a kind of misapprehension, a misconception, a, a distorted view about how we and other phenomena exist. Okay, So the, the discovery of how things actually exist is going to be the, the only direct antidote that will enable us to be free from all of samsaric suffering. All right. So if we want to be free from uh, samsara, we need to generate this wisdom. If we want others to be free from suffering, we need to help them generate this wisdom within their own minds. Right? And so by the merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, why? Because when we become Buddha, hmm, means when we fully develop all of our good qualities and abandon all of our negative ones, then uh, we achieve this state where we have all of the skills, all of the ability, all of the knowledge to guide in the most effective manner uh, others to be free from samsara. Okay? Okay? Yes? Okay. So that's why we're here, right? That's what we're doing, what we're doing. Okay? Mm. Now, of course, when we start off, then to think about all the sentient beings and the whole universe and wanting to liberate them, you know, it's a bit much, right? So even this modest, uh, you know, motivation, hey, you know, I'm, I'm realizing there's some kind of problems in, in my own life, right? And I want to be free from that. That's good. That's good. And uh, as we mm, sort of continue along, right? Uh, we can then gradually expand our level of thinking and our motivation to in include more and more beings. Okay. Mm. All right. So with that said, mm, we can, uh, yeah, recite this first. <clears throat> so I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. All right, so hmm. that is the preliminary prayers and a little bonus <laughs> commentary on that very famous stanza uh, on refuge and uh, bodhicitta. So. Okay, so now to the actual mm, 
module eight, establishing a daily practice. This is session number one, okay? So normally at the beginning of every um, session, uh, I like to give a um, little uh, stanza or quotation uh, from the kind of lineage gurus to uh, sort of, yeah, set the context and the motivation. So this actually, I've actually, you know, talked about, <laughs> yeah. So Geshe Potawa, a great Tibetan master, he said, uh, for as long as we have wandered through cyclic existence in the past, it has not stopped by itself. So mm, cyclic existence, uh, samsara is the, the Sanskrit word. That means the cycle of uncontrolled rebirth due to our karma and powered by our afflictive emotions. Primarily this misapprehension of how we and other pharmana exist. Okay, so yeah. Given this, it will not stop by itself now either. Okay. So although we've been circling in samsara from the beginning of this lifetimes, it's not like, um, you know, uh, a, a candle or an oil lamp, which, you know, when the fuel kind of gradually runs out, right, then it, it will stop by itself, right? We don't have to blow it out. It will just run out of fuel. So samsara is not like that, right? It's not that we have, you know, like, hundred million lifetimes and then after the last one it's done right so if we don't put a stop to it ourselves we're uh, not only have we taken rebirth and samsara from the beginningless time but our future samsara uh, rebirths will also be endless so hence we must put a stop to it and the time to do so is today when we have obtained leisure and opportunity so here leisure and opportunity is referring um, to a very specific uh, kind of situation that we find ourselves in, right? Uh, and we find ourselves with the so-called, it's called in the teachings, the precious human rebirth or the perfect human rebirth, <clears throat> okay? Which basically means we have all of these outer as well as inner conditions uh, such that we can make tremendous progress along the path to liberation and enlightenment, okay? So in general, you know, they call it leisure. Uh, Lama Zobarimashe, our spiritual director, he doesn't like that translation <clears throat> because, you know, usually when we kind of has the connotation, right? Like laying on the beach or, you know, not doing anything. <clears throat> but mm, uh, leisure sometimes therefore is, is translated as freedom. Right, so we have the, the freedom to practice because we have uh, you know this human body. We are not born as an animal or another kind of state of existence where it would be very difficult to practice. Right, so we have the the um, inner condition of a human body with intelligence. Uh, then we have the outer conditions of having access to the Dharma teachings. Uh, you know, so they exist in this world. We have uh, access to teachers who, uh, you know, impart these teachings, and we have the interest in uh, following the teachings and trying to put them into practice, right? So with all of these inner and outer conditions, right, we have a most precious opportunity. And so we must make use of it, and we must make use of it today, because death can come at any time, right? And uh, when death comes, you know, we will go on to a next rebirth. We might not find ourselves in as fortunate a situation as we have now. So while we have the opportunity, we must make use of it. And why? Mm, because we need to attain uh, the higher goal, not just attaining some kind of happiness of this life, but happiness of future lives, liberation from samsaras, uh, samsaric suffering, and uh, eventually the state of uh, Buddhahood or complete enlightenment. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, ooh, here already should be module eight. Sorry. <clears throat> so actually, maybe it's better to go into this. Okay. Can you see? All right, so module eight, establishing a daily practice. 
I think you all have uh, a document like this. I think this is the teacher's version, so there's a little bit more, but um, right. So what are we doing? And, and just for our newcomers, I always in the first module, I like to do this, right? We set the context, right? What are we gonna be talking about in this module? And uh, sort of have these mm, key topics in mind. And then mm, as we go through the readings, as we go through the lectures, then we should sort of, sort of uh, test ourselves, right? Um, we have this, you know, Lama Zopa uh, Rinpoche's instructions on everyday Dharma, right? So we can ask ourselves, oh, what, what are his instructions on everyday Dharma, right? And see, right, uh, if we've mm, sort of mm, understood and have something to say about all these uh, topics, right? So anyway, <clears throat> here, uh, assemble the tools you need to develop a successful daily practice using Lama Zopa Rinpoche's a daily meditation practice as a guide. Become familiar with the elements necessary to generate realizations in the mind. Receive some tips for making every action of the day meaningful. Okay. So this is important um, just to keep in mind because uh, sometimes we get very bogged down in the philosophy, right? And it's almost like, well, why? You know, there's all these lists, right? the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths, the you know, uh, 18 uh, qualifications of a perfect human rebirth, right? And then it can be like um, a bit dry, right? So the point of all this study, the point of our practice, right? The point of everything that we're trying to do is to generate realizations in the mind, right? Realizations. And this realization, it's not just some kind of intellectual understanding, you know, as, as we mentioned just two minutes ago, right? Why we have to practice now, we have this precious human rebirth, but we're going to die, right? So all of us know on some level that we're going to die, right? But mm, if we're honest, uh, it's a very superficial <clears throat> intellectual understanding, right? Mm. It's like uh, they say, Okay, sampa. Okay, sampa is this roasted barley flour. Okay, so just think of flour, right? F L O U R. Okay, if you put that on the top of uh, some liquid, it will kind of stay on the top, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if we're honest in assessing the level of our mind, uh, even though we receive many teachings they've sort of stayed on the surface level of our mind and haven't kind of penetrated, right? So, uh, for example, this realization that we're going to die, we know it intellectually, but it's only through, you know, repeated reflection and uh, meditation, allowing our mind to, to really sink into that, hmm, will, will we receive a, a deeper uh, realization and a, uh, only then have a uh, the true kind of transformative effect in our lives and our behavior. Okay. Mm. All right. So then the required topics. <clears throat> Lama Zopa Rinpoche's instruction on everyday dharma. Okay. So uh, everyday dharma means mm, you know not what we're doing on the meditation cushion. Okay, but even, you know, whatever we do, we're, we're going to work, we're going to class, we are eating, we are sleeping, we go for a walk, we go to the gym, okay? All of these activities that we do on a daily basis uh, can be transformed into dharma, means transformed into the teaching, uh, you know, based on our motivation, right? So even something, right, going to the gym, right? As an example, we can have a very worldly motivation to do that, right? Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, we're, we're going on some beach vacation, you know, next month over Christmas, and we want to look good, right? On the beach. So we want to shed a few pounds, especially with Thanksgiving coming up, right? So 
we have that motivation to go to the gym. Or, right, quite worldly, right? Or we can think, uh, yes, I've attained this precious human rebirth, right? I've uh, met with the Dharma teachings. Therefore, I want to have a, a long life so I can continue to make progress, you know, now that I've, uh, you know, learned something about Dharma. I want to have a, a long life so I can put these teachings into practice. Therefore, I'm going to the gym so I can, you know, uh, be healthy, so I can have a long, healthy life to practice Dharma for the benefit of all sentient beings. Hmm? Right? So two people walking into the gym, okay, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe the person on the, you know, doing, doing the, the treadmill next to us, they could be a bodhisattva, right? Who knows? Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, yeah, that then is how to go to sleep, wake up, eat, walk, etc. Right? So it's not, you know, uh, how to eat isn't, you know, chew your food 30 times, right? <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about here, having that motivation, thinking about all sentient beings, having the larger context, right? I'm going to sleep, right? So I can, you know, wake up with renewed energy tomorrow to continue my Dharma practice, you know? Then we wake up, right, in the morning. Oh, I'm going to get out of bed and uh, have all my actions be beneficial for sentient beings. I'm going to eat food. Why? So I can sustain, you know, uh, my energy, my life, so I can benefit sentient beings, right? All these things we can do with a, a larger kind of motivation, okay? Then <clears throat> six preliminaries. These are the preliminary practices. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna start these today. Uh, so, you know, cleaning, cleaning the place, uh, arranging an altar, um, you know, putting out offerings and so forth. We're gonna get into that. Uh, and then, yeah, how to set up the altar and then how to do the, these other preliminary prayers, refuge, seven limb prayer, mandala offerings, so forth, okay? Then the four immeasurable thoughts. Mm. Mm. So immeasurable uh, equanimity, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable love, and immeasurable joy. We'll get into that as well. Then the, uh, this Lamzo Rinpoche's daily meditation on Shakyamuni Buddha, Mm. So, by the way, I didn't see this actually in the reading packet. Do you all have that? I can distribute that afterwards. I didn't see it either. <laughs> yeah, it's a very... It's a booklet. I can. It's very odd, yeah. Uh, th there is a, a slightly updated version. Do you have the most updated? I believe so. Okay, okay. I will double check. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, we can check that. Okay, and then uh, prostrations to the 35 confession Buddhas, Vajrasattva meditation with the four point powers. Okay, these are two mm, sort of famous ways to purify the mind of previously accumulated negative karma. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Then the benefits of living in vows and how to take the eight minor precepts, the importance of daily purification and daily rejoicing, and the importance of accumulation of merit and purification for success in one's spiritual life. So here again, if it were me, I would put this bullet point ahead of these, right? So first we have to know the importance of accumulation and purification. And then the question comes, well, then how do we purify? Well, we purify through prostrations to 35 Buddhas and Vajrasattva meditation. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So then there's some practices we're also going to be talking about, this daily meditation on Shakyamuni Buddha and the eight Mahayana precepts. And then we have a two-day retreat uh, coming up with uh, precepts, prostrations, and then this practice, daily meditation. Uh, then we have suggested practices. We're going to uh, you know, identify and avoid the eight worthy concerns. Then we can talk about uh, whether and when we can do this a seven day, seven to 10 day Copan style lamb room course, a uh, seven to, uh, to 10 day retreat based on uh, daily meditation on Shakyamuni Buddha, and then mandala offering and prostration preliminary practice. You have some required reading. Uh, so you have this in the PDF, right? And then, ooh. Then we also have um, liberation of the palm of your hand. 
Um, mm. Do you guys have that? Grace and mm. Michael, is it? C, Chris. Okay. Good hint. So anyway, this is one uh, book that we've been using as a uh, kind of reference for all the various modules. Uh, it's available as a as an ebook as well as um, it's published by Wisdom Publications. And then uh, this daily meditation on Shakyamuni Buddha will distribute that to you. Uh, so other other things here you can sort of yeah read that. Uh, yeah, I think we can distribute these to you as well. Okay, so that's the overview of the module. Okay. Mm. So now, what I thought we could do is um, just kind of jump into it, okay? So these preliminary practices, where are we? Okay. Okay. So uh, now it is uh, worth keeping in mind. Uh, this word, uh, George, right, or preliminary practices, it has different meaning depending on the context, okay? So sometimes when we talk about preliminary practices, uh, some of the, the more experienced students will know, right? There's the, the, the practice before one does a long retreat in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, one does the, the mundro practice, which includes doing 100,000 uh, of uh, prostrations, 100,000 Vajrasattva mantras, 100,000 mandala offerings, 100,000 going for refuge. And, and um, uh, those are the four kind of standard. Then in the Galupa uh, tradition, they actually talk about nine preliminary practices. And uh, one does 100,000 of each of these. These are the practices that, uh, you know, really uh, help one to purify the mind of previously accumulated negative karma. Sorry. Remember I said we're doing... Uh, work on the roof yeah so they've arrived <laughs> and they're right uh on top of me so sorry about the banging uh, let me get a little bit closer to my microphone okay so those are one sense of preliminary practices okay and those uh sets of a hundred thousand okay those are called mundro practice okay now here these six preliminary practices, right? This is called the Jorch. Okay. Uh, ch is like the, the, the practice, right? Mm? Or activities. And Jor, it's like, um, yeah, to prepare, to prepare for the, the practice. Okay. Here called preliminary practices. Okay. So here there are six cleaning your room and arranging the syllables, the symbols of the enlightened body, speech, and mind. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll, I'll tell a story. Uh, okay. So my, uh, okay, myself, I'm actually uh, not very uh, clean, organized, tidy, right? My, um, my room often is, is a mess, right? And um, my, my beloved mother, on the other hand, is very neat, very you know, meticulous, uh, keeps the house uh, in an amazing condition, okay? So before I ordained, yeah, I uh, invited my mother uh, to, to come to India uh, and I was going to tell her about my decision to ordain in person. So I invited her out. She came with my younger brother. And she came up to Dharmasala, which is where I had been living, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. And uh, one of my teachers um, also 
was was uh, living in, in Dharamsala. And, you know, we were going to uh, go on a little, you know, trip in India, right? But I wanted her to see Dharamsala. And actually, the Dalai Lama was giving teachings. I wanted her to also see the kind of mm, community of all the, the people who are going to Dalai Lama's teachings. So it would be mm, less of a kind of exotic, what does that even mean? Going to Dalai Lama's teachings, have some real experience. Okay. Anyway, she comes to Dharmasala. We're about to leave uh, in a few days, and um, my room is very messy. <laughs> I've been living there for, for two years, and uh, you know I'm like trying to arrange the things I'm going to keep, things I'm going to take out. So my room is in total disarray. My mom sees this and uh, is not happy. We then go to meet one of my teachers, uh, the, the late Geshe Son Rinchen, who taught for many years at the Tibetan library. And my mother, right, after she meets my teacher, she kind of, uh, in, in her, her way, like kind of tells on me to my teacher and says, you know, I don't know, my teacher says, oh, do you have any questions? And she says like, oh, you know, my son's room is so messy. Isn't, you know, Buddhism supposed to be about, you know, order and all this? And my teacher actually agreed with my mother and was like, yes, it is the first of the six preliminary practices to clean your room every day. So my mother actually, you know, she was very, very happy to hear this <laughs> from my teacher and felt a bit, uh, you know, vindicated of all of her years of uh, trying to impart this on me. Anyway, long story, but the point is, you know, uh, we are in our meditation practice uh, mentally and actually inviting all of the Buddhas, all of the spiritual masters to come to the space in front of us to come to our room, right? And so just as, you know, if you were going to have a house guest, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So two times when my room gets very clean, okay? One was, you know, my past life. When, uh, you know, I started to, to date someone, right? I wasn't always a monk, right? But, you know, started to date someone, then, you know, they're gonna come to the room, or, you know, to my home, then I would clean very well, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. put your best foot forward. The other time that my room gets very clean is before exams. Now, why is that? This is my procrastinating mind, right? I don't really want to study, but, you know, I, I kind of justify to myself, right? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, my room is so cluttered. If, if I'm able to sort of clean up and, and get good, then I'll be able to concentrate on my studies. So I do that very well, okay? Anyway, the point is, <laughs> since we're, you know, for, forget about, uh, uh, you know, some person you're trying to woo, we're trying to, you know, invite all the Buddhas and, and Bodhisattvas to this place. So of course we need to clean. Uh, so we sweep the room, we, you know, dust the, um, the, the table and so forth, okay? And uh, then this arranging the symbols of the enlightened body, speech, and mind. So here, <clears throat> uh, you can see behind me, okay? We have the, the Buddha in front, right? Uh, to the Buddha's right, this is actually a, a statue right? of, um, of a Manjushri, yeah? To the Buddha's, wait. No, no, that's to the Buddha's left. And here is, uh, yes, there is uh, Arya Tara, okay? And you'll see even above, oh man, can you see? Then these are um, above, there's a picture of the Dalai Lama, and then uh, on this bookshelf, there are books, okay? Hmm. Now, I don't know if you can see, but in there as well are, uh, uh, is a stupa, 
Okay. So when we say arranging the symbols of the enlightened body, speech, and mind, the, the statue of the Buddha is a symbol of the, body's, uh, the, the Buddha's body. The books or the Dharma texts are a symbol of the uh, speech of the Buddha. And the stupa, um, anyway, it's a anyway, stupa, is the, the uh, symbol of the enlightened mind of the Buddha. Okay. So ideally, you would have, oh, oh, Mary Ellen has one there. You see her in the, the Zoom? You can't see. Okay. Well, yeah. It kind of looks, okay, Mary Ellen has a uh, Kadampa stupa. It kind of looks like a bishop, you know, the chess piece, the bishop, right? Yeah. Okay. But... There's actually very deep symbolism. Uh, you know, each part is symbolizing uh, different um, sort of enlightened qualities, right? So there you go. Okay. All right, so that is cleaning the room and arranging the symbols of the enlightened body, speech, and mind. It, it is worth noting, right, that, um, you know, ideally you would have uh, many like beautiful uh, statues and, and Dharma texts. Here we have actually all, all of the sutras and all of the, the Indian um, commentaries. So uh, in Tibetan, that's called the Kangyur and Tengyur. But, um, and you would also have a stupa. But, you know, some of us, uh, if we're traveling or maybe we're not living in a, a big a place where we can have a, a lot of space for these items, you know, it's okay. Uh, and don't think you have to have a, a gold plated, uh, you know, artwork. Uh, you could have even like a, a, a photo of the Buddha printed out. That's okay. Um, and even if you don't have that, that's also okay, right? But uh, since, you know, even printing like a, a postcard size photo, uh, I think that's all within our means that can be, you know, nice to do. And you can then take that even if you're traveling uh, or you can have a very, you know, small statue of the Buddha. And, um, you know, it, it's nice to, to travel with that. Okay, then we have the second obtaining offerings without deceit and arranging them beautifully. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, here, I don't know if you see here, the, these are uh, water bowls, okay? So the water bowl is a, a very common uh, feature in uh, you know, Tibetan uh, Buddhist altars, right? So um, we all have the light as well. And um, here we also have flowers. They're silk, okay? It's you know, in this plastic holder, okay? Lama Zabrimshe, he really likes silk flowers. I mean, he likes real flowers as well. And in his houses, there's always, you know, a very beautiful garden with a lot of flowers, but on the altar, uh, you know, he makes uh, extensive use of these silk flowers. Um, so, yeah, don't think you have to go out and, you know, buy, buy a dozen roses every day for your offering practice. Um, yeah, like that. Anyway, obtaining offerings without deceit, okay? So uh, this means uh, not engaging in wrong forms of, of livelihood right? Uh, like cheating others. Uh, and then uh, in the liberation of the palm of your hand, it also talks about um, five long types of livelihood here. Um, and this actually is more relevant for uh, monastics who uh, sort of gain their sustenance uh, through the, the generosity of others. But it's important um, to know uh, even for you lay people, right? So I thought to just talk about this. So flattery, right? Uh, you know, you would ingratiate yourself to a sponsor and, you know, praise them so much 
so they feel happy and they like you more and then you know they'll be more disposed to give you something <clears throat> hinting would be um you know um Oh yeah, my my iPhone screen is broken, and yeah, it's really the battery life isn't what it used to be. And you know, and kind of hinting that you want or need a new phone, something like this. Right? Then giving in order to receive, um, you might give them something small uh, with the hopes. But then they'll also like you and then say, oh, oh, man, I, they gave me a present. I didn't give them anything. Uh, maybe I should give them something, right? So, um, yeah. Mm. It's very tricky, right? So uh, many of you uh, I met last year or earlier this year, I, I, I came to to uh, San Jose, and I met many of you at Ocean of Compassion Center. And so, do you remember? I gave you incense, okay? So, I, had, I was like, oh man, what to do, right? Then you, you might think, oh man, we can't give in order to receive, so maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't give, right? <gasps> I had to really check your mind. And with a thought, right? Because the other thing is, m many of you know, in the four types, the, the four ways to um, gather disciples, right? The first one is to give gifts to your students, right? So they have this kind of good um, mm, conception and feeling about you, right? So later, when you all teach, you have to be very careful and say, all right, I'm giving this, you know, solely with uh, you know a, a pure wish to to benefit them and for me uh, i gave incense so then hopefully you in turn use that in your daily practice and accumulate a further method uh, merit by offering to you know the buddha and uh, your gurus and so forth right and have no thought that uh you know whether they give something to me in return or not i don't care okay so, like that. Number four, exerting pressure on others, right? Now, this can be like, um, uh, I don't know, if I, if I saw um, uh, Dana, right? Next time I come to San Jose, I say to Dana, hey, you know, Mary Ellen gave me this, Jan gave me that, Urs gave me this, yeah, it seems like all the best students make offerings to me. <laughs> you know, something like this, right? <laughs> so, not like that, okay? Um, yeah. By the way, those of you, I don't know, not many of you have been to India, unfortunately, right? So, we have to plan a trip, okay? We have to plan a trip. But, um, okay, you'll see these forms of wrong livelihood, unfortunately, in these degenerate times. But I don't know if, if uh, many of you uh, have heard of the city of Varanasi. Varanasi. It's on the, the bank of the Ganges River. It's a very uh, important holy city for Hindus. And um, uh, they believe that even after the body uh, of, of someone dead, right, the person dies, they take their body to the, the Ganges River and they wash it in the river, then it can purify their previously accumulated negative karma. Okay. So, um, yeah. Mm. All right. So, actually, there's many funerals that take place in Varanasi. And then <clears throat> along the side of the Ganges River, there will be uh, many cremation sites. And it's uh, actually quite interesting. You can uh, go there uh, and it's very mm, powerful to meditate on death and impermanence because you see you know, funeral pyre, pyre after funeral pyre, right? 
So you go there and then mm, there'll be some people, especially if you look like you're a tourist, right? Uh, if you look like you're, you know, yeah, if you have white skin, basically, or, you know, anyway, they know you're not Indian, okay? They come to you and they say, hey, why don't you uh, uh, help support the firewood for the poor people who don't have money to cremate their loved ones, okay? So you think, okay, nice. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I want to donate. So then they show you a book, a ledger. Right. And I'll have, you know, different people, uh, their name, uh, the, the country they're from, and like big amounts, like $1,000 or, you know, like crazy amounts of money. And it's this book, right? So, you know, you might think I'm going to give 100 rupees, you know, like, or whatever, like $5 or you know, something quite modest. But you see in this book, oh, this person, oh, from Austria gave, you know, 500 euros, this person, blah, blah, blah. So it's a kind of, oh, you know, psychological trick or, you know, what they do. Anyway, exerting pressure on others. Then five, being on one's best behavior. So uh, this is, um, again, normally, <laughs> you're not behaving well right but then you hear like a sponsor is coming right so you put on a kind of show right in general if you're just on your best behavior all the time because you think it's the right thing to do that's that's not what this is talking about right they actually uh there's a story of a, a tibetan uh geshe uh, uh ben ben Gungel right, who uh, it is said um, one day he knew that the sponsors were going to come. And so he spent the morning tidying up the meditation place, you know, dusting, sweeping, and then he put out all these very nice offerings, right, on the altar. And then right before the sponsors arrived, he, he checked his mind and he said, oh, wow. I've done all of this, not with a good motivation, but just to impress these sponsors that they would give me more money. So what he did, he took a handful of dirt and threw it on the altar, right? So it is said that uh, there's another great uh, master, Padampa Sangye, who actually had a level of clairvoyance, uh, able to see you know, others' minds and, and see kind of what, what was happening. At that point, he was giving a teaching and then he, he saw what happened and he made the comment that, uh, you know, Beshe, uh, sorry, Geshe Ben uh, Gungel has made the best offering to the Buddhas just now. Why? Because in throwing the dirt on the altar, it was then giving up these eight worldly concerns, giving up the, the thought of wanting to have a good rep, uh, reputation the thought to impress others for some uh, small material gain in this life. Mm. So like that. Okay. So obtaining offerings while deceit and arranging them beautifully. Um, yeah. I think it'd be good. So they've, they've laid out the, the bowls here already, okay? <clears throat> but I thought it'd be good just to give a little demonstration. Okay. So <laughs> normally you're gonna empty out the bowls, okay? Now it's important when you put the bowls down on the altar that they should be face down, not face up. Why? Face up, you know, if it's empty bowl, it's inauspicious because it's kind of um, like you're offering nothing, okay? So you should always keep empty bowls face down, okay? Now, what you would normally do 
before you um, fill the bowls, we kind of clean them, okay? And what we do is we take incense. We light the incense. And when we light incense, we say, Om Ahum. It's a mantra. Om Ahum, Om Ahum, Om Ahum. Om Ahum. Okay. Now, we get a cloth and we wipe, we wipe the bowl. And what I've heard is you can, you can wipe it three times clockwise, three times counterclockwise. And here, you know, to make it more meaningful, not just all, I'm, uh, I gotta dry these bowls, but to think as you're wiping uh, counterclockwise, you think you're purifying um, the obscurations to liberation. And as you do uh, clockwise, uh, that you're purifying the obscurations to omniscience, right? These are the two goals we want. We want to be liberated from samsara and we also want full enlightenment, okay? like that. And then you see the smoke rising, right? So then you kind of fill the, the bowl, right? Put it over the smoke and then you put it down, you know, face down like this. Put it on your altar, okay? And then normally the, the, the set of uh, water bowls is seven. So you do that, you know, to all seven. Okay, I only have three right here, but you get it. Okay, like that. So then they're all clean, they're all incensed. And now you can fill them. Okay, so you take your first bowl, you take your water, clean water, right? Water that's suitable to drink. So that's more of a, a relevant concern here in India. So the first bowl you fill <clears throat> quite to the top, right? <clears throat> you leave a, just a little bit of space on the top, right? Then you take the first bowl and you pour the contents into the second bowl but you leave a little bit left over. I don't know if, can you see? Right, a little bit left over because we don't want an empty bowl face up on the altar. And then we put the first bowl down. Then from the second bowl, we go to the third. Now you put it next to each other with a um, kind of, you see a little bit of space in between, right? So not touching, it'll be like about like this, right? Like a grain of rice space in between. You do that until you fill all seven. Then when you fill all seven, you go back and you, they're already on the altar. You fill the first, second, third to almost the top. Okay? That's how you do it. Now, after they're all filled, there's going to be um, some kind of mantras to recite. And, um, these things we'll, we'll see, we'll come to it in the, the daily meditation practice. But this is just setting up the altar, arranging the, the offerings beautifully. Okay, that's where we are. Okay, arranging them beautifully. All right. So now, step three, adopting the seven featured sitting position of Vairochana on a comfortable seat. All right, so let's talk about that. So first of all, comfortable seat. Uh, you want to have, ideally, a cushion. So I have this cushion. And I have that just, just under my butt, okay? Now, I'm sitting on a larger cushion, or you can be sitting on a bed, right? So if you just have the, the you're sitting on the cushion, but then your tailbone is slightly higher than your knees. You understand? Right. 
because my knees aren't uh, supported by the cushion, right? So my cushion is only under my butt, and then the, the, the legs kind of slope down slightly, okay? That's good. Now, the seven featured sitting position of Varachana, okay? It's um, kind of seven, also called the seven point posture. So the, the legs should be uh, either full lotus, right? The, the uh, sort of uh, feet on the opposing thighs, right? Or the half lotus where you have one foot on the, uh, the opposing thigh, but the other one underneath, right? <clears throat> or um, just sitting comfortably cross-legged, that's fine. Mm. Um, those of you who might have knee problems, you can sit on a chair. If you do sit on a chair, then uh, have both feet flat on the ground. Don't cross your feet. And then come up from the back of your chair so you're not leaning on the backrest. Okay. All right. Then one, that's the, the legs. Two is the hands. So here you have your left hand down, right hand on top, and thumbs touching like this. <clears throat> you put that in your lap. Now, right now, I'm sitting in half lotus posture with my right foot on my left thigh. And when that's the case, when I put my left hand down on my heel, it's in the perfect position, okay? It should be about a hand span below the navel, okay? Mm, like that. Then, that's second point. Third point is the back. Back should be straight. So what that means is not slouching over, but you know, sitting, sitting upright, okay, and aligned. So one thing to think of is if you drop a coin from your nose, will it hit your belly button? Okay. Sometimes uh, I might start in a nice posture like this, but as the session goes on, start leaning forward, you know. <laughs> so not like that, okay. Mm. straight okay then uh the shoulders right so oftentimes we have hunched shoulders let's see hunched shoulders so you can roll them up and back so that your scapula your shoulder blades are in line with the body okay this will also kind of open up the chest cavity which will help us have more uh full and complete breaths mm. <clears throat> then the chin gently tuck in, so kind of pressing in on, on the, the Adam's apple or yeah, throat like this. You'll feel some elongation in the back of the neck. Okay. These two with a straight back and having the chin tucked in, it helps to align the energy uh, channels in the body. Hmm? Then the mouth. Mouth should be closed, teeth not clenched. And then put the uh, tongue on the palate above the, you know, just, just behind the upper teeth. Okay. Now, you can also have a little suction such that there's no kind of air. Hmm? Like that. Okay. <clears throat> then the eyes. Eyes should be just slightly open if possible. In general, <clears throat> some meditation teachers say to close the eyes. In this tradition, um, it is said to try to keep them just slightly open to allow some light in, because when you have the eyes totally closed, it can be uh, very easy to fall asleep, especially when you're sleep deprived. Hmm? Mm. Okay. Yeah, like that. All right. So <clears throat> is that seven? Legs, hands, spine, shoulders, mouth, eyes. Huh. Oh, tuck the chin in. Yeah, that was seven. Yeah. Now, sometimes you'll see the eight featured position okay 
So the eighth feature is then the breath. So once you get into this uh, meditation position, okay, then normally our mind is racing here and there, is very distracted. <clears throat> and you see, it's going to say, after which you take refuge, develop bodhicitta, and so on, while in an ex especially virtuous frame of mind. Okay, <clears throat> so since our minds are very distracted, we might be, you know, stressed out or, or I don't know, racing thoughts. It's good then at the beginning of the session, before we try to cultivate this especially virtuous frame of mind, to relax, let go. And this meditation on the breath is a very powerful way we can do that. Okay. So when you're in the meditation posture, I like to uh, give these instructions that, uh, you know, the mm, Tibetans say that, you know, your body should be on the cushion and your mind in your body. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Our racing mind, what is it thinking about? It's thinking about the future, all the things we have to do, our to-do list, or it's thinking about the past. Oh, I can't believe, you know, this person said that to me, <laughs> or maybe we're um, criticizing ourselves about mistakes we've done in the past. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, it's not in the present. It's not in the present. So uh, the, the body is on the cushion. Now, when we have our mind in the body, what that means is we become aware of our body in this present moment. So what I like to say is we ask ourselves a question at the beginning of the session. And we say, after we've gotten into the posture, we ask ourselves, how do we know that we're sitting? So you can do that. How do we know? So maybe you feel the weight of your body on the cushion beneath you. Okay. Mm. And if you're very attentive, you know exactly, you know, what, where, uh, you know, what parts of the body are in contact with the cushion beneath you and what isn't. If you're sitting in half lotus posture, you can feel your, your legs, right? Uh, the, the one leg pressing on the other. Okay. So hone into that. Hone into that. As you get in, bring your mind into your body, right? You're then automatically focusing on, on the, the present. And those thoughts about the, the, the past and the future will fall away. Okay. So you've done that. You also check a little bit. Are you holding any tension in your body? So especially in the face, oftentimes you have a kind of, you know, squinting, some 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 tension around the eyes so soften all that okay soften those muscles in the brow around the eyes around the lips hmm. yeah like that let go of any tension scan your body there might be some tension in the shoulders right keep our shoulders up you know relax let go <sighs> you know and at this point if there is some tension that's a bit harder to diffuse by just uh, you know bringing our mind's awareness there, then try to think as you breathe out your next exhalation, you're also breathing out the tension you know, in your shoulders. Breathe in, don't breathe into your lungs. Think you're breathing into the shoulders. Breathe out. As the out breath goes out, also the tension in your shoulders goes out like that. Okay. Then, after you have released all that tension, then you can go on to uh, the breath. And in a similar way, you can ask yourself, how do you know you're breathing? And again, it'll vary, right? Some of you might feel, uh, hone in on that rising and falling of the abdomen, right? You feel that. Some of you might feel your chest expanding and contracting. Some of you might feel the air as it passes over the skin in the nostril area. Okay, So wherever it's most clear for you, that's fine. Okay.
Now, as you're focusing on the breath, there might be other appearances that come to the mind. There might be sounds. There might be other thoughts that come up, right? When that happens, don't engage. But you can be aware, but not engage. Awareness, not engaging, then it'll be like, for example, right? We might think, oh man, these workers are so loud. They're dropping cement blocks off the roof, right? <laughs> but at night, when the workers have gone home, there's some crickets, you know? Just some nice little nature sound. When that happens, <clears throat> right? It doesn't disturb, right? So all, all the sounds can be like that. We're aware of the sound of the cricket. It doesn't disturb our, our peace, right? Like that. <clears throat> not engaging, not commenting, not giving commentary, but just kind of bare awareness of what's happening in the present. Hmm? Like that. Also, for us beginners, it's, it's helpful to count the breaths. So you breathe in, breathe out. At the last moment of, of the exhalation, you count one. Out, breathe two, like that. It's also very helpful, in, in my experience, to try to become aware of those split seconds when the inhalation becomes exhalation and the exhalation becomes inhalation, right? And you'll see in the text to make your breath like a, a, a grain of barley. Okay, so what does that mean? You know, a, a grain will kind of be, you know, not, not quite an oval, but like they have kind of sharp tips, right? So what that means, it'll be like a, a, you know, if you know music, like a crescendo and decrescendo. So as you start to breathe, it's, it's like the volume of air is low, right? Then it gets more, and then toward the end, as your lungs fill up, then the volume of air coming in is, is less and less. So it should be like that. Okay, like that. So just be aware of the breath, count the breath. When you get to 10, start over again at one. And um, ideally, you could get to about 31 counts, right? Uh, without losing the breath, without losing your object. If, on the other hand, as you're breathing, you notice your mind has wandered off, it's okay, no problem. Just start over again at one. Don't judge yourself. Don't think I'm a bad meditator and so forth. Just start over, okay? This meditation, it's, uh, you know, a kind of mental training, right? <clears throat> so whatever we're trying to do, when we're, when we're novice, uh, you know, we don't have much skill, so it's going to be difficult, but we have to just continue to practice. And as we get more experience, then uh, it'll get uh, better and better. Okay. So that is the uh, seven featured. And then eighth, eighth point is the breath. Okay. After you get, uh, yeah, 31 counts or at least some mental stability, calmness. Then you can go from the neutral state of mind to the especially virtuous state of mind. Okay. <clears throat> but to go from negative, distracted, all the way to especially virtuous, difficult. So we pass through this neutral state first. Okay. <clears throat> so now, how do we do that? Here, I'm going to go to this, this text that was referred to many times in the literature, right? So <clears throat> a direct meditation on Shakyamuni Buddha, how to meditate on the graduated path to enlightenment. Okay, so this is Shakyamuni Buddha. <clears throat> okay, so here, all of what we've done thus far, 
right? We've got into a good meditation posture. We've arranged our, our, we've arranged our offerings and so forth. Now we're in that neutral state of mind. Now we're going to go to the extremely virtuous state of mind by reflecting in this way, right? In the motivation, okay? Now it refers here to this other practice that, that Rinpoche has, um, has compiled, the method to transform a suffering life into happiness. If you haven't done that, then you can do this one. Okay. So here is worth noting, right? We just did the breathing meditation. That type of meditation where we, uh, it's called placement meditation. We place our mind on one object and we try to hold it there without letting it wander, right? That's the way to develop uh, concentration. Now, there's other types of meditation where we are mm, trying to analyze. So it's called analytic meditation. We try to arrive at a certain conclusion and uh, let it sink in. And then there's another type of meditation called uh, like a scanning meditation, okay? where we go through a series of contemplations, like a, a kind of logical sequence, and uh, sort of arrive at a conclusion at the end. So this, at the beginning, our motivation is a kind of scanning meditation. We're going through different contemplations, right? So we think how extremely lucky I am that I have not died yet. I'm especially lucky that my death didn't happen last night. Okay. So depending on your time, you can, uh, you know, after each sentence, pause and just let it, let it affect your mind. Not just that you're, you know, kind of skimming through, but really feel, wow, I'm extremely lucky I didn't die last night. Wow. Yeah. Let that sink in. Let, let all these words affect your mind. Okay. I'm especially lucky that my death didn't happen last night. Mm. How wonderful and fortunate it is that today I'm still a human being, a state that is extremely rare. But that is, this is not all. I have a perfect human body, which is also extremely rare. So here, perfect human body doesn't mean six-pack abs, right? <laughs> it means having those outer and inner conditions by which we can practice dharma, right? Mm. So this is rare. I have met the virtuous friend, that means the spiritual teacher, who reveals the unmistaken complete path to enlightenment and is extremely difficult to meet. I've met the Buddha Dharma, which is also extremely difficult to meet. So why? Uh, here, we've talked about this in the context of the precious human rebirth, but you know, uh, since beginningless time, although we've taken uh, you know countless light, light, uh, rebirths, actually, most of the time the Buddha Dharma doesn't exist, right, in the world. It, it, it requires you know a Buddha to come to the world and teach. So even now that the Buddha Dharma is here, it's not always going to be that way. And in a few, I don't know, centuries, maybe, you know, the Buddha Dharma will not exist in this world anymore. Since I've met all of these extraordinary, extraordinarily fortunate circumstances, I should not waste my life in any way. I should make my life as useful as possible for the infinite mother sentient beings hmm. so here uh wasting my life in any way so the, the worst the worst would be after we've attained this perfect human rebirth by which we can attain enlightenment in this very lifetime right yeah so instead of doing that to then uh engage in negative actions, negative karma, uh, which are the causes of uh, lower rebirth, right? We have the opportunity for complete enlightenment. Instead, we get a lower rebirth. That's the biggest waste. That's the, the biggest kind of uh, 
tragedy. Okay. So <clears throat> how then we don't waste time is to make our life as useful as possible for infinite mother sentient beings. Now, why? Why should we do this? Because their peace and happiness depends upon me and my happiness is received only from their kindness. Okay. So in a, a small way, right? Hmm. Let's say uh, we take a vow not to kill another living being, right? Then every living being we come into contact with, even that mosquito that's buzzing around, even uh, whatever, the, the ants, cockroaches, whatever, right? When we've taken the vow not to kill and we uphold that, they receive that level of peace from us, right? And my happiness uh, is received only from their kindness. Okay, so why is that? Now, in a worldly sense, the food we eat, the uh, <laughs> entertainment we, we watch, right? I don't know. Uh, the, the job that we have, uh, you know, is dependent on others, right? Our customers. So... Uh, any kind of knowledge we have is uh, we've received from you know teachers teaching us everything we're all interconnected so that's even on a worldly level and then on a, a kind of broader level right the fact that we are able to generate this mind of bodhicitta wishing to benefit all sinning beings wishing to achieve enlightenment for their benefit which is the main cause by which we'll attain enlightenment in the future, right? If sending beings weren't suffering, then we couldn't develop compassion for them. Without compassion, no bodhicitta. Without bodhicitta, no enlightenment. So the mere fact that there are sending beings that are suffering enables us to achieve enlightenment. So that ultimate state of happiness, the happiness of enlightenment, is dependent on sending beings as well. So the greater use of my life to other sending beings, the more it becomes the means to achieve success and happiness for myself, right? <clears throat> hmm. okay. So the more we're able to, to devote our lives to others, the more we're able to benefit others, well, on a karmic perspective, we're attaining more, uh, you know, positive karma, which ripens as, uh, you know, happy, happy experiences in the future. But also, um, if we do it with a special mind trying to, uh, you know, achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings, then every action we undertake with that motivation becomes a cause for our eventual enlightenment. So then the purpose of my life is to free all sinning beings from suffering and its causes, negative karma and disturbing thoughts, and to lead them not only to the ultimate happiness of self-liberation, freedom merely from the sufferings of samsara, right? You understand? This is nirvana. We talked about samsara being uh, caused by negative karma and disturbing thoughts. Mm. So not only to take them to that state of liberation, but to the peerless happiness of full enlightenment as well. This is my responsibility. Okay. So this is an important one. To think that I am responsible for the happiness of all sinning beings. Why? Because whether my actions are helpful or harmful to them, Huh. Okay. Let me see if I can close this window. One second.
So, so there's good news and bad news. I was able to close the window, but the effect that it had on the sound is negligible. Can you still hear me? Más o menos. Okay. <clears throat> Change the gain and sit closer to it. Is that better? No? Not really. There's, there's this uh, diesel generator right outside the window here. Mm. Okay. Well, we have only about six more minutes anyway. Okay? So let me. Uh, just finish this. Yeah, it's just two more paragraphs. Okay. So I am responsible for the happiness of all human beings. You can hear me? Yeah, okay. Why? Because whether my actions are helpful or harmful to them depends completely on my own mind on whether I have compassion or not. By generating compassion, I immediately benefit numberless other human beings. At the very least, I do not harm them. So this is what I was talking about, right? When we make the, the determination and say, I'm not going to harm, I'm not going to kill uh, mosquitoes, then they receive that level of peace. The ultimate purpose of my life is to do perfect work for others in order to fulfill that purpose. It is necessary for me to achieve the state of full enlightenment, the omniscient mind. And in order to do that, I must actualize the path to enlightenment. Okay. So... Uh, in other modules, we were going over this Lam Rim, or Path to Enlightenment. So basically, all of the teachings that the Buddha taught uh, are means to achieve enlightenment. But there is a sequence, an order, in which uh, we should put those teachings into practice. And so the, this order of, of practice is uh, what has formed this new genre, or not new. It's over you know, thousands of years old, but uh, this this genre of the Lamrim or the stages of the path to enlightenment. Okay? Therefore, I'm going to do actions that become only causes for me to achieve enlightenment and bring uh, to bring all sinning beings to enlightenment as quickly as possible. May all my actions become only causes for me to achieve enlightenment and to bring all sinning beings to enlightenment as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's the motivation, right? This is the especially virtuous state of mind that was referred to in uh, step three of the preliminaries. Okay, then, right, taking refuge in the gurus. So, here, remember? So, after which you take refuge to help the and so on. Okay, so that's what. So we have, uh, uh, yeah, maybe four more minutes. Are there any questions now? Me? Um, so I was wondering um, about the bowls on the altar. How often are they cleaned and changed? Is it every day or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be every day. Um, so normally, what the Tibetans do, they will empty them before they go to bed. But what Lama Zopar Rinpoche, what he does is, uh, because then it will be no offerings for eight hours, right? So he's given the advice that, you know, you can keep them overnight and then in the morning you empty them and then fill them up. Thank you. Okay. okay. Now again. Yeah, do what you can. Right? So 
um, sometimes in the case of like DC. You know, so I have one of these lights on my altar too, right? It's nice, it's just lighter. Turn on the switch and it's, it's done, right? So I admit, busy leading up to exams, and I kind of wasn't offered. These here is done by one of the new monks, and he has done it as a kind of uh, for the house, right? And what Lama Zopanushe, what he also says, at his home, at, uh, at Kopan, at the various gombas, uh, there's people offering you know, many offerings every day. And he says, then all the students all over the world, they can imagine that they're making those offerings as well. Anything else? Okay. So um, maybe we can uh, end it here. Um, yeah. So at the beginning, you know, we set a very positive motivation. Then at the end, Well, dedicating the merit. So what this means is um, to make sure that the, the positive energy that we've created in our time, that it ripens in the most effective way. Okay, so this is a good one. There's not so much time, so we'll just do this, right? So due to all the past, present, future months of the the Nuts Buddhas, and then the Sun Beings, may all the war, famine, disease, global problems, and all the dangers of earth, water, fire, and wind be stopped immediately. May perfect peace and happiness prevail in everyone's hearts by their generating of kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. May the Buddha Dharma from where Sun Beings receive peace and happiness last a long time and spread in all directions. May also need to meet the Buddha Dharma to achieve and be as perfect as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Venerable. So, yeah. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Venerable Monjo. Yeah. Venerable Palmer. Mary Ellen and Nurse. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.